All right, hello everybody. Chuck Holton here, and I want to make sure that you can all hear me. So tell me where you're coming in from. Oh, so Tanya B is in Mayfield, Kentucky. Uh, I really wanted to get this done today because this stuff is going to be old news. And uh, the, the news in Israel and everywhere else around the world is progressing very, very quickly. Uh, so if we don't talk about it now, it's going to be old. And um, so how many of you watched the uh, eclipse today? I mean, the rapture didn't happen. The end of the world didn't come. The, you know, there was no big rift that opened up in America and people fell into it. Uh, so I, I guess that was kind of a, a not, not such a big deal. And by the way, uh, they didn't end up... Uh, slaughtering the red heifer, as far as I know, <laughs> either. And so I just kind of wonder what's next on the uh, Christian apocalypse uh, bingo card, uh, because so far we're, we're not doing too well on predicting the end of the world. Um, uh, so my my daughter-in-law in Armenia, we were laughing about this whole uh, uh, eclipse thing and all these people who are saying that this is a sign of the rapture and this is a sign of the end times and everything and it's like there's <laughs> there's an eclipse somewhere on the world every 18 months and uh, why is it that it's only the end of the world when we have one in the United States uh, what is it about the United States it's uh, it's like well the United States is going to get raptured but the rest of the world is going to keep on rocking I guess um, anyway uh, I'm just Killing time until everybody gets on here. Thank you very much for watching. Please go and hit the like and subscribe button down there if you haven't yet. If you have subscribed, you might want to go check and make sure you're still subscribed because apparently uh, people are being unsubscribed for, for no reason. Um, so let's not talk about the red heifer. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, it's it, it just like for a month or more, before Easter, we had every single live people were asking about the red heifer. And it was just like, I finally just got really tired of it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my daughter got to watch the eclipse. She sent us video. I saw it uh, on, on TV, on CBN's live broadcast. So that was cool. Uh, but, all right, let's talk about what's going on here with the World Central Kitchen uh, tragedy that's happened. There have been some new context or some new information that's come out about that uh, about that um, event and I think it bears going over, bears talking about because it'll help us get a little better idea of uh, what, whose side is has the moral high ground here. Now I want to ask you some questions to get started uh, the questions being, um, would you expect that in an actual full-on kinetic war that there would never be any uh, friendly fire incidents? You like my shirt? I do what I want, as long as my wife says I can. Um, would you expect that there would never be any mistakes in a war, that, that uh, no friendly fire would ever, ha ever happen, no civilians would ever be killed? Um, if you believe that, you, you've just never been in a war. Uh, war is messy, it's dirty, it's lethal, it's incredibly lethal, and anybody that's around... Uh, <laughs> Connie's taking issue with my shirt. Um, any, anybody that is in the area of a war uh, is, is going to be at risk. I've spent the last 21 years covering wars all around the world, and I can tell you that uh, it's risky. There, there is some modicum of risk that you take even being in the area where a war is. And that's just all, how, it, how it always works. And it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's a difference in scale sometimes, uh, the United States, typically, uh, up to 20% of our casualties uh, are attributable to friendly fire. 
uh, that is uh, what we call blue on blue incidents where uh, you have, you're, you know, you're moving through a city, trying to clear a city, and there's some guys that are engaging in a firefight over here, and there's some stray rounds that end up striking their own guys over, that are, you know, working over somewhere else. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to deconflict uh, between friendly forces. And in this case, uh, in the case of the World Central Kitchen, you're trying to deconflict between the the military forces and some non-military forces, and you have a malevolent factor in the mix, which is Hamas, that the front, that the civilian forces are being forced to work with in order to do their jobs. Think about that. For the World Central Kitchen to distribute the aid uh, that they were distributing in Gaza, do you imagine that they could have done so in areas where there are civilians without any contact with Hamas? Uh, think about that. Hamas is specifically using civilian populace, uh, civ civilian populations inside Gaza to hide among and to fight from. Okay? So, it's, uh, it's virtually impossible for anyone who is distributing aid to the civilian population to not have any fire. There's no collateral damage. It's not possible. There has never been a war where there was no collateral damage. Uh, number two, if there is collateral damage, what would you want a, a civilized country to do in the case of something going wrong? Okay, when something goes wrong, would you want them to sweep it under the rug? Would you want them to, you know, say, we meant to do that? No. Uh, we, you would want them... Oh, not again. Can you hear me? Let's see if my network is working correctly here. Well, I am... I am connected as I'm going to get, folks. So I hope you can hear me. I am... Tell me when I'm back. Did the internet just go out? Am I back? Stand by. I mean, I'm literally connected uh, with a Cat6 cable. <laughs> no rapture. I don't even have my phone. Let's see how we do now. Okay. Well, okay, we've got... There we go. It's coming back up. Nope. Dropped to nothing. Anything yet? Four forty-seven, three forty-four. Okay, it looks like we may be doing better now. Hello? <laughs> Yeah, just my luck. Are we back yet? Nope, the internet keeps going out. Bring me your phone, please. Every flip in time. All 
All right, let's see if that works now. It looks like we've got a little better. Okay, we're back. Okay, good. All right, sorry about that. I'm literally connected with a Cat6 cable here uh, directly to the modem. And welcome to Panama. Okay, so, all right, we're back. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'm on Connie's cell phone, actually. So we'll see how that works, if that come and go, comes and goes. Grant, why is President Biden... Let's see. Testing one, two. Oh, I think maybe this might be the problem. Let's go to another camera and see if that will work. All right, how's that? Now we got a camera. Okay, so I just changed my camera and that, that may do the job. Good grief. This is frustrating. All right, so what I was talking about was uh, would you want a civilized military, what would you want them to do in the uh, event that there was a mistake? in the event that some, there, there was some civilians killed or there was some uh, collateral damage. What would you want them to do? Well, I would want them to do an investigation, to find out the facts. And uh, I would want them to take steps to make sure that this never happens again and that the military is incentivized to make sure it never happens again. Now, the reality of being in the military is that um, whenever something goes wrong, somebody has to be held accountable. Uh, I mean, that's just, that's just how it goes. Someone has to be held accountable uh, when, when there's a, a mistake. And so that's normally the commander. That's just kind of how it works. I mean, the commander... Uh, very likely might not have even been there when the mistake was made. But, they, you know, he's, he's the, the buck stops at his desk. Let's put it that way. Okay? So if the buck stops at his desk, then he's the one that's going to have to pay the price. I'm going to dumb down this picture a little more and see if that helps. Okay, so if he's the one paying the price, uh, they're going to have to fire some people. And that's exactly what they did. Now, let's talk about it for a second. Uh, this is uh, from Manny Fabian, who's an Israeli journalist, lives in Beersheba. He's very good. I follow him on uh, Telegram. He says, uh, two senior officers will be removed from their roles and several other top commanders in the Israel Defense Forces will be formally censured. That means their careers are over, basically, uh, for their involvement in the deadly drone strike against a group of aid workers with the World Central Kitchen Organization in the central Gaza Strip earlier this week. Now, I asked you those questions before I read that because I want you to understand that this may mean, I mean, the, the, the fact that they are firing people does not necessarily mean that they're admitting that, that all of this was all their fault. Uh, they're firing people because somebody needs to be made to pay as a deterrent, uh, as a motivator for other, uh, for the next time. Right. And if if nobody's made to pay, then there's no incentive for them to get better. This is how it works in the military. But it does not necessarily mean that they're saying that this is 100 percent our fault. Now, there's some more information that has come out about this. And it's, I put this context up on my locals page. So if you go to chuckholton.locals.com. You can just go to chuckholton.com. It'll take you to the same place. Uh, but I put this up on there, uh, and 
so I want to go through these point by point. The IDF revealed that Hamas purposely drew fire to the world central kitchen, kitchen convoys, uh, convoy. At around 10 p.m., the IDF noticed suspicious activity as the WCK vehicles uh, jo joined a convoy of other Hamas vehicles. Now, that in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that the World Central Kitchen guys were Hamas operatives or anything like that. Like I said, they cannot distribute aid in uh, you know, all, the entirety of the Gaza Strip without interfacing at some level with Hamas. That Hamas still ha is around enough that they're going to have to do that. Okay, so the fact that there were some Hamas vehicles that were, you know, around in the area, that's just part of the war. It's part of the fog of war. All right. Uh, so uh, Hamas terrorists then climbed onto and into the World Central Kitchen trucks and fired several times indiscriminately into the air to ensure the IDF would see them. That's a little bit of a stretch. I mean, it's not necessarily a stretch, but uh, a, a journalist has to look at this and go, okay, these guys fired indiscriminately into the air. Why they did it, we don't know. But it certainly did ensure that the IDF would see them if they started shooting into the air. And it's likely that the terrorists knew that when they did it. The convoy then split up and part of it entered a hangar <clears throat> which, uh, where it became impossible to tell uh, which vehicles were inside, whether it was all World Central Kitchen vehicles or all Hamas vehicles because they all entered this hangar and there were vehicles coming and going from the hangar all the time, apparently. <clears throat> this is new information now. This is something that we didn't know before. The IDF attempted to call the World Central Kitchen workers and the World Central Kitchen headquarters on two separate occasions to confirm whether or not they were with the Hamas convoy, but nobody answered. Okay? Now, that's a big deal. That is huge. I mean, what? Wait, we weren't told that before. We, weren't told, we were told that the World Central Kitchen convoy had deconflicted with the IDF before they left on their late night convoy. I mean, why do you have to do a convoy at 11 o'clock at night? That's, uh, that's kind of suspect anyway, right? But, okay, so it, it happens. They called, they deconflicted with the IDF, told them, okay, this is the route we're taking, this is where we're going, this is what we're doing, this is what we look like, right? And, and then they went on their convoy. But when there was some... Uh, confusion about, wait a minute, we, we're following all these vehicles and there's some Hamas vehicles and some World Central Kitchen vehicles and they're going like this and they're driving together for a while and then they enter a building where we can't see what's going on and then some vehicles, now these were white Toyota Land Cruiser SUVs. Do you know how many of the, what percentage of the vehicles in Gaza happen to be white Land Cruiser SUVs. I would say that is probably one of the most common vehicles in Gaza, point period, end of story. In any war zone, the white Toyota Land Cruiser SUV is pretty much ubiquitous. Every aid agency, that's what they use. The United Nations, that's what they use. Every ambulance is typically a white Land Cruiser. Uh, every, uh, um, and, and many times, important people use those Land Cruisers as well because they're very durable. They're very good in um, non-permissive environments, bad, you know, roads and stuff like that. They're ubiquitous, so they're easy to get parts for, right? Uh, okay, Blink, I see you. 208 workers killed since January 1st. We can talk about that if you like. Uh, yeah, I myself have a, a 2019 Toyota Land Cruiser 75 series troop carrier, 
at, that I bought as an ambulance, uh, as a private ambulance here in our little town in Panama. Uh, and because it's a great off-road vehicle, Connie and I go camping in it sometimes. It's a, just a great all-around off-road vehicle. So they're just very, very common in that area. So for some of those vehicles to have been, you know, uh, maybe other white Toyotas, that then mixed with the white Toyotas of the World Central Kitchen, and then they all go into a hangar where the drone can't see them anymore, and then some come out the other side, you can understand why there would be some confusion about who's who, and who are those guys, which one has those guys that were carrying weapons and shooting in the air? Because we want to kill those guys. We don't want to kill the other people. So they tried to call the World Central Kitchen on the, you know, on the phone, on the radio, they tried to get in touch with them two different times. And they got no response. So, and this is where the, I would say that the, the mission kind of went wrong. The people in charge, now, uh, now oh, one more thing. There was an hour, uh, gap between when these vehicles entered the hangar and when they exited the hangar. Okay. So again, there were lots of vehicles going into this hangar and other vehicles coming out of the hangar and they just mistook them for the wrong vehicles, terrorist vehicles. So it wasn't that they didn't know that there was going to be some people delivering aid out there, but they were all mixed up and an hour went by. Some of the vehicles left. Um, they were driving, you know, again, late, late, late at night. And the stickers that they had on their rooftops were probably not visible from a drone because they weren't, uh, I mean, look, the military has um, infrared strobes that they give to the soldiers. Uh, and we put them on our vehicles. We put them on our helmets. Uh, there was one time, I think I, I mentioned this in a, previous live where um, we used to, back in the day before we had infrared strobes, we had what we called glint tape. It, this infrared reflective tape. It's just like the, you know, you see uh, the reflective vests that, you know, road workers wear or something like that. They have the silver stripes on them that at night uh, when they get hit with light. This is the same concept, except it only reflects infrared light and so the only people that are going to notice that reflection are people that are looking through night vision goggles because night vision goggles can see in the infrared spectrum right so we had this infrared reflective tape that we wore on our left arm when we were here in the invasion of panama and so what happened was we were out, I got sent out on a, uh, are, am I gone again? Looks like I'm gone for some people and I'm not gone for other people. So I don't know what to tell you. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we got low, pretty low bandwidth here, but there's not much I can do about it. Am I still connect? Oh, I know why. Let's try this. Your hotspot went off, baby. Okay. Let's try that again. Okay. So uh, what I was saying is uh, <laughs> Jay Luther, just because the bombs are dumb doesn't mean the pilots are dumb. Uh, so the fact that you, you've heard this, uh, let, let, let me answer this question. I'll go back and I'll repeat what I was saying. Uh, the fact that you've heard this narrative that the IDF was dropping dumb bombs on civilian neighborhoods, number one, they told the people in the neighborhood to leave. Number two, they dropped small bombs on top of the buildings before they flattened the buildings in case anybody was left in the building to let them know 
that they needed to get out. And number three, just because the bomb is dumb doesn't mean the pilot is dumb. And so uh, saying that they're dropping a 2,000 pound dumb bomb on a civilian neighborhood is disingenuous because it was a civilian neighborhood until all the civilians left. And if the civilians decided to stay after being told that they were about to attack the neighborhood, well, it's hard to feel sorry for them. If, if the IDF said, we're going to attack this neighborhood, if, and so you better leave, and the people said, no, I think I'll stay. Well, okay, sorry. We've got to do our jobs here. And the pilots dropping the dumb bombs still get to aim the bombs. And because they have complete air superiority, it's pretty easy for them to hit their targets, even with a bomb that is not a precision-guided munition. Okay? So there's that. I hope that answers that, uh, that comment, uh, Luther. Uh, but uh, drones don't have a conscience, Gator Mike, but the people driving the drone do have a conscience. That drone doesn't drive itself. It's not piloted by AI. It's piloted by, uh, it's, it's piloted by a person. Okay. Well, Luther, I mean, you can say that it's BS to drop dumb bombs, but again, since the pilots aren't dumb, then the bombs aren't that dumb either. Uh, they, it's not like they're just carpet bombing, which is the insinuation you're making here, and that's pretty disingenuous. You're making the insinuation that the IDF is indiscriminately bombing Gaza, and that is just not true. They are very discriminately bombing Gaza, and whether, the, whether they use a precision-guided munition or not is irrelevant, okay? Yes, yeah, Scott Ritter is a fool, I agree. Okay, so what I was saying is, the, today's military has uh, ways of telling who the good guys are on the ground. What they do is they have a, uh, an infrared strobe light that goes on top of the vehicle or goes on top of the um, some soldier's helmet, something like that. Uh, and uh, hard for you to feel sorry for dead babies. Luther, you need to leave, brother. I'm sorry. But between you and me, I would venture to say I'm the only one that's had to hold one of those dead babies in the last couple years. I'm the only one that was there to see the dead Israeli babies that were murdered by Hamas. So, I'm sorry, you need to leave. Uh, all right, so, I, and I'm sorry for the connection, folks. There's not much I can do about it. I'm doing the best I can here. Um, Hamas, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the IDF did not provide any kind of infrared strobe or marking devices for the, uh, the, the NGOs that were working in the area, okay? They could have, but they chose not to. They didn't do that. And that was an oversight on their part. They, they really should have done something more to... Uh, be able to tell friend from foe when it comes to that. But again, the, the information that's coming out shows that Hamas was intentionally using the rules of engagement and the deconfliction uh, pathways that the NGOs had with the IDF to create chaos and to set the IDF up to make a mistake like this. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. They were, the, the, the IDF made some missteps here, no question about it. And they are taking steps to rectify those, those missteps. But the new information that's come out is that Hamas is using the, the good graces of the IDF to even allow uh, aid agencies to deliver aid into Gaza, where they know their enemies are taking that aid and taking advantage of it. 
they are using that, those rules of engagement in order to try to move public opinion against Israel in order to, uh, because again, that's their best weapon, in order to try to win the war. And it was effective. Look, Hamas has lost more than 10,000 of his troops, of its troops on, on the ground. Hamas has lost at least 95% of their capability to make war. They're not 100% down, and uh, they're, not, they're not out yet, but they are down. And if the IDF continues the fight, the IDF will succeed at destroying Hamas's ability to make war. They may or may not succeed at destroying Hamas itself, because Hamas is more of an idea almost. But they will make it very, very difficult for Hamas to present a military threat to uh, a military threat to Israel. Okay. Look, you can criticize me all you want. I don't, I don't mind if you criticize me, but I'm going to push back if you're being disingenuous. I'm going to let you know. So, yeah, yeah that's right, uh, Gloria. War itself is not, a war, is not a crime. There is such thing as a just war. And what Israel is doing is, without a doubt, more just by every metric than the war that than any war that the United States has engaged in since World War II. Now, I'm not saying that the U.S. wars were not just. I'm just saying that by every metric of a just war, this war from Israel is more just than any war the United States has taken part in since World War II. And that comes from somebody who served in the U.S. military and has covered uh, the, every war since, since World War II. No, not since World War II, although it looks like it. Um, no, I've covered every war since the beginning of the War on Terror in 2001. And the problem with what Israel is doing now by pulling troops out of Gaza. I mean, it's hard not to say, not to draw a line between what happened with the World Central Kitchen and the IDF pulling out of Gaza all but two, two brigades. They had 23 brigades in Gaza at one point, at the height, and now they have two. So, a matter of fact, I, I have here, thank you, Gator Mike, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, I have here a map this is from 2023 Gaza War on Twitter that shows where the IDF troops are now and where they have been. So if you look here, the light gray is, uh, the light gray shows where the IDF uh, cleared places where they, that they had taken and they have now withdrawn from. And the black areas are the areas where the IDF is still, where they still control. So look how little of Gaza is actually under IDF control right now. Now, this goes completely against the media narrative, which makes it sound like Israel is in there with an iron boot on top of the necks of every person inside uh, Gaza I showed this video uh, today on the CBN uh, live that I did. This is a video from uh, Deir Abala, which is right in the center of Gaza, right where the W is, where it says Wadi As-Saika, uh, whatever that says right there. Uh, pick this up again. All right, Thunderbolt Ethernet connected. Maybe we're back. Are we back? Okay, am I frozen? Coming in loud and clear. Okay. 
All right, so yeah, look, I'm I'm watching the connection. It's not great, but it's the best. Grant, I've why is President? Okay, so here's the market in Gaza. Again, this is look look at all the rubble in the background. Look at those buildings back there. Okay, there's jewelry stores. There's look at here these yellow cans on the left of this. These yellow cans are uh, Neato. That's baby formula that's available there. All right. So, yeah, I mean, this is... <laughs> DJ Holiday, you're talking about uh, my friend. DJ Holiday says, Chuck, there was a fantastic guy on Sean Ryan's show speaking on journalism in the Darien Pass with you. I would love to hear all your stories. That was my friend Michael Yan that was on there. And uh, yeah, well, he and I have been to the Darien Gap many times. Okay, so it looks like we've got a connection back. Uh, so anyway, bottom line is uh, this new information, while it doesn't completely exonerate the IDF from the, the drone strike on the World Central Kitchen, it does give us some more context, and that context is important. And I, I hope that what you've been able to get out of this very choppy podcast, which I'm recording this, by the way, so I'll clean it up and I'm going to re-upload it in high quality onto my, my uh, website uh, later, so you'll be able to watch it without all the glitches if you want. Um, so... The point is, I hope that this, inter th this uh, podcast has given you some context so that you can understand a little more about the challenges of operating in a theater of war, about the uh, sort of inherent conflicts of interest between these NGOs having to work with the enemy and work with the friendlies at the same time. I mean, these guys have a very difficult job. I've done this with the Free Burma Rangers. Like you have to, um, you have to deconflict with the good guys and the bad guys at times. And that's very, very difficult. So, you know, they're doing a dangerous job. Obviously, we should do whatever we can to try to allow these NGOs to, to get in there and to give aid to the people who need it. But I think it is important to say, to show, uh, again, contrary to the media narrative, we've got lots of food in the market. The IDF is only in the areas that are black here. Okay. That's the only place where the IDF has troops right now. And that's a pretty big deal. Uh, I mean, that, that is very instructive. If nothing else, it's instructive on how dishonest and disingenuous many in the media are when they are specifically making it sound much worse than it actually is. All right? So that's what I wanted to say today. Uh, I really appreciate all of you who watch. I appreciate all of you who send me emails and support. Uh, go to chuckholton.com. You can uh, subscribe over there and, uh, and even support monthly if you want to. We're trying to do the best we can here and keep it going. So uh, again, I will upload this video to my website without all the glitches and you can watch it or share it if you like from there. And um, so thank you again for everything, uh, everybody being on, online here. That's all I got for today. So God bless you. We'll see you again later. Bye-bye.